Hello, everyone. This is Siddharth Damber from Chicago Arthritis and Regenerative Medicine. Welcome to our webinar today on regenerative medicine treatments. As I'm talking, I've got a little bit of material, maybe about 20, 25 minutes of stuff to discuss. Please enter in your, your questions. A lot of the questions I'll probably cover during the talk, but I will certainly leave time in the middle and also at the end of the talk as well to go through any questions you may have. So what will we discuss today? So number one, you'll learn about what are the best available non-surgical treatments for arthritis and tendonitis and injuries and back pain that do not require surgery. What is legitimate and not legitimate in the field of regenerative medicine. So you can choose the best physicians and clinics for your own treatments if needed. So the big question is, what would you do if your pain was controlled? How would your life improve? What exercises would you restart? What activities with family and friends would you participate in? So who am I? My name is Siddharth Amber physician here in Chicago at Chicago Arthritis and Regenerative Medicine, specialist in rheumatology, also specialist in image-guided musculoskeletal injections, in practice since 2008, involved in regenerative medicine since 2008 as well, and involved in the Regenix Network, which is the largest network of physicians that are working together in regenerative medicine, and in that since 2012, for the last 10 years. So my journey to regenerative medicine really started with my own shoulder. I used to play fairly high level tennis when I was younger. As I picked it back up as an adult in my mid thirties or early thirties, I noticed that I'm starting to have some shoulder issues. At around the same time, I'd started to learn diagnostic musculoskeletal ultrasound, which allowed me to look at tendon ligament injuries in a very different way and made me realize that a lot of the traditional treatments that we were using were really ignoring what was causing pain and what the problems were. And it sent me down the trajectory of looking for other options for not only treating myself, but also treating patients as well. So the traditional care model for joint issues or tendon issues is very insufficient. Uh, that's whether you're talking about arthritis, joint pains, tendonitis, sprains and strains, back pain. It's really focused on just masking the pain and waiting for eventual surgery. The equivalent of that would be if you had diabetes, would be if instead of treating the diabetes, you're just waiting to have your first stroke. It's not how people would treat diabetes at this time. And you know we should do a better job when it comes to treating arthritis and tendonitis. So main problems with traditional care, it doesn't fix the problem. Pain medications do have side effects as well. Traditional injections, including steroid injections and nerve block injections, have a lot of side effects as well that you need to be aware of and careful of because they're not really treating the source of your problem. Surgery can be uh, appropriate in, in some patients. It's definitely overused. Uh, it's definitely higher risk than non-surgical pro processes. It can accelerate the arthritis process in terms of common arthroscopy surgeries that are done for shoulder and knees. It can lead to more instability. Many routine surgeries that are still done are not proven to be more effective than just uh, physical therapy or sham surgery. And really, for those of us involved in regenerative medicine, there's a strong feeling that eventually 80% of what's being handled surgically right now should be able to be handled non-surgically in the future. So in searching for better options, looking for treatments that are low risk with minimal side effects, but actually improve the cause of the problem and can actually give you longer term improvement. So imagine reducing your pain and getting back to the activities you care about without surgery or pain medications. So regenerative medicine is the process of using your body's own cells to treat your musculoskeletal issues. So if you think about how the body normally heals after an injury, take something as small as a paper, uh, paper cut on your finger. What you have are platelets that infiltrate the area. They release growth factors, which stimulate your local stem cells and recruit other cells and growth factors as well, which then causes inflammation, which then causes a slow cellular repair process. 
This works really well in tissues that have good blood supply. In tissues that do not have good blood supply, that includes uh, tendons, cartilage, ligaments, discs, labrum, and meniscus. Uh, these do not heal as well on their own. So regenerative medicine is a process of using your own cells to coordinate that normal healing process and to do so using very um, focused um, image guidance to do that. So there are challenges when it comes to finding a regenerative medicine physician, which I'll talk about. So there are a number of things you should be thinking about. Number one, are they appropriately trained? So is your physician appropriately trained in musculoskeletal conditions or are they trained in something else and sort of jumping into this as well? That's a problem. You want to work with someone who's really just focused on musculoskeletal conditions. Number two, two are they appropriately focused? I, I, I see other physicians who dabble in this kind of um, uh, practice. And the problem is they're not very focused and thus not really experienced. Um, and when I say appropriately focused, you can think about this in other ways as well. An orthopedic surgeon is very skilled in surgery and in the musculoskeletal system, but they're not as skilled or practiced when it comes to using image guidance, x-rays, and ultrasound to do these sort of non-surgical treatments. On the other hand, you may have a lot of pain clinic doctors who are appropriately trained in terms of musculoskeletal system um, uh, conditions, as well as image guidance of treatments, but they're not focused on the right treatments. Instead, they're using steroid injections, nerve block injections, really damaging tissue long-term. That's not the right person to be doing regenerative medicine either. You need someone who really is focused properly in these treatments. So in addition, are they, do they really understand how regenerative medicine actually works? Do they understand how prolotherapy works when it comes to treating the soft tissue structures? I'll talk about that a little bit later. Can they create a um, plan that is tailored for you? Important to understand. Most physicians and clinics that do regenerative medicine are taking basically a one-size-fits-all perspective. They're, they're um, locked into whatever um, platform or format they use to prep their cells. That's important because if you have, let's say, knee arthritis, that should be treated very differently in terms of your um, cells that you create than let's say you have a lower back issue or if you have a rotator cuff issue. Each one of those deserves a different type of platelet and, and stem cell um, processing. And if you work in a place that is not as nuanced with that, they're going to give you a one-size-fits-all process. And then lastly, again, do they have the correct skills for the job? Namely, um, do they not only understand the musculoskeletal skeletal system, do they understand how regenerative medicine works, and do they have the imaging guidance, and do they have the right focus? Again, are they focused on these treatments, or are they dabbling in it? Dabbling never really works that well. So why regenerative medicine? It treats a source of the problem, which is chronic instability and chronic inflammation. It's safer than surgery for sure. It's effective for most musculoskeletal conditions as well. So how does regenerative medicine work? There's a number of different ways that it does. If you take tissue that's been damaged, again, the normal way that your body heals is by putting the right cells into that area to start the normal inflammation healing process. And so in tissue that's been either chronically damaged or too much damaged by putting in your own cells into that area, you're then being, you're then being able to optimize the, the health of the tissue that's been damaged. Number two, part of treating a entire joint is you need to treat not only that one area that's damaged, but all the other supportive tissues. That's what prolotherapy is. And you do that by treating, let's say someone who's got knee arthritis, you want to treat not only the knee joint, you want to treat the ligaments, the tendons, other soft tissue structures, even the bone and nerves as well. That goes a long way to actually make a big difference for how regenerative medicine works. Number three, we reduce chronic inflammation. Number four, you can actually improve neuromuscular health by treating the nerves as well, which makes a big difference in terms of strength as well as pain and function. So a couple of really basic FAQ questions or frequently asked questions, is this legal? Simple answer is yes. While there is fluctuating guidance that's been coming from the FDA over the last two decades, the, the reality is that there's some very clear rules. Number one, you have to use your own cells not somebody else's cells. Number two, the cells cannot be significantly altered or adjusted. Uh, what that really means is that they need to be processed the same day and then re-injected the same day. And they have to be used for orthopedic tissue. 
uh, that that is considered um, uh, acceptable by the FDA guidance. If your physician is trying to use it for other organs or conditions, there's very little, little evidence that it works for these other conditions and really very much against FDA guidance. Common question I see is if I'm older, should I use someone else's cells? And the simple answer is no. For the vast majority of orthopedic conditions, there's very good evidence that using your own living cells is effective. There's definitely risk when you use somebody else's cells. Your body is not prepped for those other cells. In addition, there's legality. There's legal issues of using someone else's living cells in the United States. You can only use your own living cells in this country. Is there an age limit? Simple answer is no. The one exception is for hips, where age over 65 can be a problem. But for all of our other conditions, age does not make any difference. And that's based on not just my opinion, that's based on the evidence of what we see in the published literature when it comes to using PRP and bone marrow stem cells. Next question, what sort of doctor does these treatments? It should be a physician who's focused on musculoskeletal conditions. If your doctor is doing age management on the side, treating erectile dysfunction, treating high blood pressure, and then jumping in to treat your, your knee arthritis, your lower back issues, they're not focused. They're dabbling. You don't want to. You don't want to deal with someone who's unfocused like that. Number two, they should be focused on non-surgical treatments. Orthopedic surgeons are good at surgery. They're not trained in doing these kind of injection-guided procedures under under image guidance. Um, and then lastly, you want a proper regenerative medicine expert, someone who understands a lot of the details of what we're talking about today. Can these treatments help if I've already had surgery? Simple answer is yes, but it really depends on what kind of surgery. If you've had, let's say, a routine arthroscopy, um, I'll show an example of someone who's had lower back surgery. And uh, in those kind of cases, yes, these can still help. If you've had a joint replaced, then that's a different story, right? Not, now you've got metal or plastic in the area. And if you've got pain from the hardware, that, that has to be addressed by your surgeon. If you've got pain because you've got a pinched nerve or some other issue, that can still be treated though. My general rules for orthopedic surgery is try to keep your own anatomy, avoid the routine arthroscopy surgeries that don't have a lot of evidence or data that supports them, avoid, cut, avoid surgeries that routinely cut out tissue that leaves the joint chronically unstable, and always consider regenerative medicine treatment option if you've been recommended surgery. Okay, so a couple of key regenerative medicine concepts we're going to talk about. Stability is a big one. I mentioned the term prolotherapy. It's based on this idea from architecture called tensegrity. It's this idea that if you take individual units that may be weak on their own, if you put them in close approximation and compress them, you have an overall unit that's much stronger, an overall, um, uh, an, an overall structure that's stronger. So uh, the concept in biologic tissues is that if you inject cells into those supportive soft tissue structures, you can strengthen them and you can then lead to a stronger joint, a more stabilized joint, which then leads to less damage in the joint long-term, improved pain, and better function as well. The keys here are to treat the layers and depth that are actually involved in a problem. Too often I've seen um, uh, other physicians that'll say, for example, let's say someone who's got knee arthritis, they're injecting cells only into the knee joint neglecting to treat all the other layers of tissue, whether it's the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, the fascial layers, myofascial layers, the peripheral nerves in that area, and sometimes even the bone, they're only treating the joint. They're missing out an opportunity to, to really fully treat the joint. You need to treat all those layers and the depth of those layers. And by doing that, what you get is progressive strengthening of that tissue over time, which then leads to longer lasting results. So this is an example of a gentleman who has chronic lower back pain. He's had surgery in the past. The issue with lower back surgeries or spine surgeries in general is that if you've got compression of a nerve or nerve damage, spine surgery can be very helpful to take pressure off that nerve. If what you're dealing with is more pain, the problem with, with lower back surgery is that it's not as good at actually treating pain. So pretty common is that you'll see someone who's had lower back surgery in the past and they still have pain years later. And part of that is because they're only treating one focal level. And part of that is because even if you treat one level, there's still the same amount of force going through that, which then leads to 
um, pressure on those other segments and thus continued pain. So in this gentleman's case, he'd had surgery in the past, <clears throat> a laminectomy surgery times two, still having pain. We ended up using platelets to treat his epidural space, the muscles, facet joints, and ligaments. Had an initial 30% improvement. We then progressively moved on to using his own bone marrow stem cells. He's currently at 75% improvement and still doing very well. Orthobiologics. These are the biologic cells that we used for these treatments. Again, it uses a normal healing process. And again, important to use your own cells, not somebody else's. So platelets. Platelet, uh, platelets are key when it comes to that initial response to an injury, recruiting other cells and stimulating your own stem cells, utilizing inflammation to get that process going. So there's different types of platelet products. And it's important to recognize that which one you use depends on which area that you're treating. If your physician only has a one-size-fits-all perspective, then they won't understand that you need to use a platelet preparation, a different pl platelet preparation if you've got a joint issue versus a tendon issue versus a muscle issue versus a ligament issue versus a nerve issue, and even a bone issue. And if you don't, you're not treating this correctly. You need that kind of nuance that unfortunately the vast majority of physicians who try to do these treatments are, are missing. They don't quite have that nuance here. So this is a case study of using platelets in somebody. This was a 45-year-old man. He's, a, um, he's an active cyclist, very active, had patellar tendonitis. He was following with a sports medicine physician, just not getting better, so referred to me to see if we could help him out with his knee issues. So in his case, we ended up using platelet-rich plasma. We did that two times. And what that did for him is it um, uh, helped him to get back to his full capacity. He came back in three years later. Now his other leg, he had a hamstring tendonitis issue. Again, used platelets again, and now his pain was resolved and he's back to activity. On the right side, this is a picture of what that is. Uh, that's the kneecap. This is the needle. This is all under ultrasound guidance. This is the tendon. The, the key here is that you want to be so precise with your treatment. You want to be treating uh, very definitively only the pathologic tissue, not the other tissue that may be healthy. So uh, in his case, um, number one, he did very well with platelets. It's a great example of a tendonitis doing very well with platelet-rich plasma. Number two, it's a good uh, example of how repeat treatment can actually help people even more. And then number three, it's again a good um, example of how image guidance is really necessary here. The next type of orthobiologic that we use are stem cells. So this is the main cell that drives tissue repair after an injury. Again, use your own cells, not somebody else's. Next, understand that bone marrow derived stem cells are legal in the United States. Fat or adipose derived stem cells are not legal in the US. You can use fat or adipose for structural support, but the way that it's processed is considered illegal in the United States. So if you're getting a stem cell treatment, you want to be getting your own bone marrow. And you get that bone marrow from the back of the pelvic bone. Um, uh, you do not need to be sedated for that. Just a little bit of local anesthetic is more than good enough to control that kind of discomfort. Uh, and that's the right way to actually do a stem cell treatment. You may hear about other types of cells. You may hear about amniotic or umbilical cord cells. Physicians who are offering those and calling those a live stem cell treatment are not being honest, or they may not understand the difference. There are no living cells in those products. And the reason why is that after they've been collected after birth, the only way that they can be utilized in the United States per FDA guidelines is that they need to go through a processing um, protocol that requires the tissue to be dissolved, pulverized, become a powdered solution, and then sit on the shelf waiting to be used by the physician for up to two years. There's no living cells on that when that's been tested. You may also hear about physicians who are using platelets or, or bone marrow stem cells and injecting it via IV. There's no evidence that that helps with orthopedic conditions. I would be very, very careful about any clinic that's offering that. Um, they probably don't um, fully understand what they're doing. In terms of outcomes, um, even if you have an advanced degree of arthritis, it's surprising how much pain and improvement and functional improvement can actually occur. And that occurs because number one, you can reduce inflammation um, chronically. You can improve stability in the joint by treating all those soft tissue cells. 
You can get cells that have been chronically damaged and start getting them to start working better, which means that they start pumping out the healthy or correct types of proteins. And what I find is that in patients that have been um, chronically um, limited because of an issue, if you can stabilize that joint, improve the pain, slowly improve their function, the next thing you know, they're doing a little bit more exercise, which means now their strength is starting to get a little bit better, which then helps with overall support of that joint. And then they just get into a good cycle, a positive cycle where they're feeling better and better. Can we improve x-ray and MRI images? If you've got advanced arthritis, no. If you have a physician who's showing you an x-ray of advanced arthritis and showing how they can make that look differently, that's not legitimate. You, you, you want to really run away from that kind of clinic. That, that, that's not accurate. If you have a tendon or ligament tear that's small, then that can still actually improve not only clinically in terms of your symptoms, but also on imaging. If you have swelling in a joint or in the bone, that can improve. If you have a condition called avascular necrosis, that can improve as well. So great question I hear all the time is, can we treat bone-on-bone -bone arthritis? Um, to begin with, I would say, if your physician's using the term bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, which is a term that's maybe 70 years old, it's number one, not an accurate term. If you have, let's say, advanced arthritis of the knee and your, and your surgeon tells you you've got bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, and yet you can still flex your knee almost the entire way, you don't really have bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, right? It's unfortunately a throwaway term that a lot of physicians use that is not really accurate. Uh, arthritis is a biologic condition. It's not just a condition that you can look on a x-ray image. It's not a picture. It's a biologic condition. And so the treatments that we utilize for that, orthobiologic treatments, platelets, stem cells, can help because it's a biologic condition. In particular, if your range of motion is good and still intact. So the caveats of this are, number one, um, if you have advanced hip arthritis, it's a different situation. It's more challenging. I generally recommend those patients go for surgery. But for advanced knee or lower back arthritis, that still responds very well to treatment. In addition, expectations, I would kind of um, always temper your expectations if you've got a more advanced condition. We can improve pain and function. Improving imaging is, however, unlikely. So it's so a case of, you know, can we actually improve tendon and ligament injuries? So this is an ACL case. If you've got a partial thickness tear, definitely for full thickness tears, some of them can actually be treated with these treatments. So this is an example of a 28-year-old man. He's a butcher. He stands for hours on end. He plays volleyball during the summers. At an ACL tear, I saw him a few years ago. At that time, we ended up using his own bone marrow cells. Uh, within three months, Symptoms were resolved, no pain, and he's restarting you know, more dynamic activity. The picture on the right is an important one to understand. This is the knee, this is the kneecap, this is the thigh bone, this is the shin bone, this is the needle here. And deep inside, what's lighting up here is the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament. You cannot inject that blindly. You really need to do that under very high level x ray guidance. So in this case, I'm injecting his. ACL, and this is what he gets three months later. He has not only significant pain relief, functional improvement, activity resumption, but on the left side is his MRI of his ACL before treatment. So I'm going to show you a couple spots here. This is the bottom of his ACL. It's intact. The middle of his ACL and the top of his ACL are very hard to distinguish. They're very hazy. The radiologist has read this out as likely a full thickness tear. Picture on the right, same ACL. Now what you see three months later is a very linear structure, one that's very clean and essentially normal looking. And that's been read out as prior ACL tear has resolved. So great case of where he had not only great clinical outcome, but imaging outcome as well. It's an example of a gentleman who is a general contractor for 30 plus years, 35 years. He came to me, he does a lot of overhead activity as part of his job, and he now has chronic pain in his shoulder. It's an, a, an ultrasound example of where after stem cell and PRP treatment, um, he goes from a full thickness tear to one that's no longer torn. So the ultrasound on the left, um, this is his tendon. 
this is the gap in the tendon. This big gap in the tendon is a tear in the tendon. This is three months later. This is the tendon again, and that prior gap in the tendon has been filled in, right? That, that, that makes a big difference. That's not only improvement in pain, it's also improvement in, um, uh, improvement in uh, um, uh, function as well. So he, he's actually doing quite well, function as well as in imaging as well. So I have colleagues who really think that because of their experience, just by palpating the skin, they can target where they need to inject somebody. And um, you know, when you start to learn about ultrasound or x-ray guidance to do these kind of procedures, you realize um, how, how nonsensical that is. You, 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 can't, you cannot inject these structures blindly. And for my colleagues who say that, you know, I, I think they're really just guessing where they're placing the needle. And if you're injecting steroids, you know, it's not as big of a deal because um, steroids are fat soluble. You can inject somebody's toe and their headache will feel better. But when you're injecting somebody's cells, whether that is um, uh, platelets or bone marrow, um, when you're injecting it in a very targeted fashion, you're injecting it into a one millimeter by one millimeter spot. Otherwise you're not gonna get the response. You have to be that precise. And if you're, you can only be that precise with ultrasound and x-ray guidance. So ultrasound on the left, um, this is an individual's uh, rotator cuff. Um, this is a very small tear. This is a needle. And that's the needle tip injecting into that very small tear. This is a magnified image. This is like a 10X magnified image. And so that spot is very small. You cannot do that blindly. The image on the right, this is someone, it's another shoulder example, um, uh, who um, this is um, uh, the humerus, this is the glenoid, it's all part of the shoulder joint. This is the needle here. And this is the shoulder joint. There's a little bit of contrast in there under x-ray to make sure we're hitting the right spot. And this other triangular structure is a labrum. We injected that as well. Uh, and again, you can really only do that kind of precision, precision with proper image guidance. These are pictures I showed before. The one on the left is a patellar tendonitis case. The one on the right is a ACL case. Again, all cases where you really need that precision. It's an example of a avascular necrosis case. Avascular necrosis means that you have uh, essentially um, dying bone. And if the bone dies, it can collapse and lead to worse arthritis and get very bad. So you need to treat that very early and aggressively. And so um, using your own bone marrow stem cells, you can do very well if this is targeted under x-ray guidance. It's an example of a 41-year-old man on the screen. He's a chef. He stands on his feet for 12, 13 hours at a time. He came to me because he had avascular necrosis in his ankle. We treated him and you know, he is several years out now and doing really well. Picture on the left. This is the ankle joint right here. This um, white uptake right here, that is avascular necrosis. Three months later, that avascular necrosis is gone, the fluid is gone, and he's doing fantastic. So that, that's essentially curing his avascular necrosis, which is an exciting thing, because that really prevents him from significantly worse problems long-term. Regenerative medicine treatments offer safe and effective solutions for your pain. So some common questions that I get, is this too good to be true? So there's evidence behind these treatments since the mid 1990s. Philip Hernigues, a orthopedic surgeon in France who's been doing these treatments since then. So he has data going back 25, 27 years. The Regenix Network, there's data going back to 2005. I hear a lot of physicians who are interested in these kind of treatments who don't have experience will say things like, well, these treatments, they're low risk, they may help, but I don't know if it's gonna make a difference or too new. The reality is they're not new. They've been around for a couple of decades. My personal experience goes back to 2008. Um, I think if you're inexperienced and new to the field, it seems new. This is a rapidly developing field, but it's not new. If you're experienced, you've had time doing this, you realize that there's right and wrong ways to do this. And if you follow the right ways, you can get patients with good results to get good results. Important to have expectations that are grounded in reality and evidence-based medicine, though. If you're getting pie-in-the-eye expectations, that's not accurate either, right? You want to have um, expectations from your physician 
that are very conservative, that, that are appropriate as well. So how long do results last? Again, there's data in the Regenix network that goes 15 years now at this point. Philip Hernigue has experience that goes over 20 years. What I tell people, again, is think conservatively. If you have a chronic condition, expect that somewhere down the line, in maybe a few years, where repeat treatment would be helpful to keep that initial treatment improving. The best way to maintain results after treatment are to improve your biomechanics with physical therapy, continuing exercise afterwards, taking the appropriate supplements so we know help with inflammation and arthritis, and lastly, repeating treatment, if needed, is additive um, to that initial treatment. Cost, somebody asked about cost. So these are not routinely covered by insurance. There are some exceptions. The Regenix corporate plan, uh, there's a website up there. If your insurance, uh, if your company is self-insured, they can add the Regenix benefits to their benefits plan, um, where, whereupon it's then covered as any other kind of insured procedure. If not, the general cost in the United States, uh, you'll see that is, is that PRP roughly is $2,500 and up, and, and bone marrow stem cell treatments are $8,500 and up. The keys to determine value are, number one, is your physician and clinic a true regenerative medicine expert? Are they focused on this? Do they know what they're doing? Are they dabbling? Or are they an actual expert? Number two, are you receiving a real stem cell treatment via your own bone marrow, or are you getting an amniotic or umbilical cord treatment that is not any living cell? You have to be very careful there. And lastly, understand that these are in-office procedures. You do not need to be hospitalized or go through a surgery center. If you do, you'll end up racking up more facility fees, and you can avoid that as well. So a little bit more, just in brief, our approach here at Chicago Arthritis and Regenerative Medicine, focus on non-surgical treatments for your arthritis, tendonitis, injuries, and back pain. Always starting an evaluation by saying, what's the big picture in terms of inflammation, instability, asymmetry, neurologic issues, trying to originally correct with low-risk interventions, exercise, and supplements. Most of the patients that come to us have already tried multiple things. Uh, it's rare that we get someone who's really never tried anything for, for their issues. If conservative treatments are not working, then we talk about regenerative medicine treatments. Number one, using the best available treatment options for, from your own body, a plan that specifically is tailored to your condition needs with platelet and stem cell preps that are very specific to your, to your needs, and then delivering cells using very precise um, uh, high-level image guidance as well. I think these should be the bare minimum. The bare minimum should be very high. Uh, in terms of what, what you should expect from your physician from these kind of treatments. So I see there've been a few questions that have come up and I'll start to go through those. Uh, but if you have any questions or um, that you'd like to ask us in the future, or if you wanna know how to get evaluated, three different ways, you can go to the website, chicagoarthritis.com. You can email us at admin at chicagoarthritis.com or you can even just uh, um, call us at 773-348-7171. Okay, great. So let's see these questions. <clears throat> All right, question about, am I an orthopedic surgeon? I'm not, I'm a rheumatologist. I'm also um, um, an expert in image-guided injections. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the challenge uh, for orthopedic surgeons is that they don't have the right sort of um, training with image guidance or with regenerative medicine. So they're, they're usually actually not the right people to do these treatments. They're experts in surgery, which is very different than these kind of treatments. Okay, what is the bone marrow protocol you mentioned? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but the way that you um, get your own stem cells, it comes from your own bone marrow. And so you do a bone marrow aspiration from the back of uh, the hip bone. We take out, it's done under just local anesthetic. Our average patient tells us that discomfort is roughly a three out of 10. We then prep that same day into a high concentration of your own bone marrow cells. We then re-inject that on that same day as well. Okay, somebody asked about insurance coverage. We talked about that, usually not. Um, uh, HSA and flex accounts, right? I mean, you, you have to obviously ask your, your, uh, the administrator that handles that but those kind of accounts are made to handle these kind of elective um, uh, costs as well. And so they, they should be covered under that. That's actually a good option if you have that available. Do you become less dependent on meds and supplements? 
Meds, for sure, right? Like our goal is to get you off pain medications. Uh, if you've been on it for many, many years, that can be hard. Part of our treatment protocol is we need you off any anti-inflammatory medications, including ibuprofen, Advil, or Aleve. That's hard for people originally because they're so used to it. But what I like is you can gauge a person's expect, you can gauge a person's improvement initially by are they back to their baseline um, kind of life or activity level despite being off the pain medications. And then progressively as they get better without the pain medications, that's a really great sign. So that, that, that's what we're looking for, for sure. In terms of supplements, I think supplements are additive. They're, they're not necessary, but I think they are additive in that they can help with inflammation in different ways. And so I, I do still encourage people to take supplements, but trying to get them off pain medications for sure. Okay, somebody asking about son-in-law in a serious accident, hardware in his lower leg and no cartilage. Is there a non tubular treatment to relieve his pain and increase functionality? Yeah, so it, there, there's a lot of details that need to be figured out there, right? Number one is, um, number one is what areas are actually problematic, meaning are we talking about an ankle or a knee that, that's painful? Uh, if so, is there any hardware already in the joint or is it just hardware that's in the bone? If the joint itself is still um, uh, not replaced or there's no hardware in it, then that can still be treated. Alternatively, if he's got chronic pain in the leg because he's got a pinched nerve in the lower back, again, that can be treated as well also. So for sure, I mean, I, I would definitely look into that, especially if he's already gone through surgery. What is the Regenix stem cell protocol, right? So um, Regenix, again, network of physicians, not just in this country, there's actually sites around the world. Uh, we're sort of loosely affiliated, but we use all the same, uh, we use all, all the same protocols in terms of treatment, in terms of lab prep and quality control as well. Uh, for the stem cell protocol, there's a three-step protocol that we utilize for all of our patients that, that's been in use since 2005. You're welcome. Uh, appreciate the, uh, thank you. Uh, how long is the procedure? Is a uh, patient under local anesthesia? Okay, so how long is the procedure? Depends on what procedure we're talking about. If you're getting platelet-rich plasma, there's an initial blood draw in the morning. You're in the office for probably about 30 minutes. And then there's a reinjection of tissue in the afternoon. Uh, that can take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, depending on what area and what structures need to be treated. Uh, we do routinely use local anesthetic, of course, to numb up the area. Um, we will uh, occasionally use sedation. We'll have an anesthesiologist sedate patients in, in cases where um, we think that's more appropriate, but that's, that's not routine, but local anesthesia all the time, of course. Okay, somebody asking about <clears throat> pain of retrieval. You must be talking about bone marrow. Um, it is not as bad as you, as you think it is. People tell us it's about a three out of 10. I, um, I think you have to understand there's a difference between a bone marrow aspiration for a cancer patient versus a bone marrow aspiration for what we're doing here. Bone marrow aspiration for a cancer patient, you're talking about somebody who is already very ill. Um, they may have lost a lot of weight, a lot of muscle. Um, uh, again, they're suffering from a systemic, very severe disorder, severe condition. They may already be getting chemotherapy or radiation. A lot of their normal reserves are down. Uh, I think even the setting of that, whether it's an interventional radiology or in the hospital, it's, it's just a more stressful setting. Um, for these kind of procedures, which are elective, where um, you know, if, you do, if you do this enough, patients really shouldn't be that uncomfortable with this. Uh, I think if your physician is maybe not as well uh, experienced with this, then, then, um, then, then there may be more discomfort just because they're not as, um, they just don't have the skill set at that point. <coughs> Rehab requirements, you know, I, I routinely recommend physical therapy after treatment, just because I think it's low risk. And I think a good physical therapist is worth their weight in gold. And I think they can get you back to your activity levels very fast. Back to normal work slash play. Um, part of it depends on what's your normal. Are you talking about what is your new normal for the last few years? You know, hopefully we can get you better than that. Are you talking about your, your normal from when you were 18 years old and now you're 50 years old? You know, like we can't, we can't turn back the clock. We, we can't reverse time like that. But we can certainly get people to a higher level. What I normally tell people is expect from a timing standpoint is 
Um, first couple of days after treatment, expect more inflammation and discomfort, then stiffness for about another week or two. And then really more noticing significant improvement at the one month mark, and then improving for several months afterwards. For platelets, that improvement, um, I normally see that around up to three months to six months. Uh, there's studies out there saying even longer than that. For bone marrow, I always say give it at least six months up to 12 months to see how well you're doing as well. How long will it last? Again, the, the, the evidence out there, there is data that shows that people have an enduring response for 10 plus years in some cases. Um, I tell people think more conservatively, which means if you've got something that's chronic that you've been dealing with for years, expect that you may need um, a repeat treatment somewhere down the line earlier than that. That might be in five years, it might be in a year, just depends on the person. Ongoing visits after procedure. Well, frankly, I think for musculoskeletal care, if you're only getting a procedure and then you know a, um, um, a shake of the hand, then you know a, a call us if there's a problem. I, I I don't think that's really appropriate medical care. Um, what we normally do is we stay in touch um, at around the one week mark, one month mark, and then every three months or so for the first year to make sure people are back on track. Um, Okay, there's more billing questions, follow-up included in price. You know, there, there, there's, there's a cost for procedures and there's a cost for follow-ups. You know, this, this is not like surgery where they have global fees and things like that. that that's, that's a different kind of scenario. With moderate arthritis in the hip, which treatment is recommended? Great question. So if you've got moderate osteoarthritis, I, I would recommend using your own bone marrow stem cells. Um, uh, platelets can work as well. Um, for moderate hip oste osteoarthritis, but stem cells are more reliable. Hips are such that you have to be um, appropriately aggressive. If you're doing platelets, you should expect that it's going to take a few treatments to get the out ideal outcome. And so I think bone marrow tends to be stronger in that case. Is stem cell the best option to repair hip cartilage? Um, number one, if you have chronic arthritis that's causing cartilage wear, um, you're not going to be able to um, change what the cartilage looks like on your x-ray or MRI, uh, not based on the current imaging. There's some evidence actually that you can get the cartilage to look healthier on MRI, some of the more experimental MRI research uh, grade MRI images. Um, I, I'm still very hesitant to tell patients that you can repair hip cartilage. I think that cartilage can be healthier but to say that you're repairing it, you have to be very careful about using that because you're not going to be able to fill in a huge gap of cartilage with any treatment that's available right now. But stem cells are definitely a better option for, for hip arthritis, stronger option than just platelets. Okay, do these treatments help cartilage thinning versus cartilage tears? Yes, absolutely. I mean, cartilage thinning, that, that is what osteoarthritis, degenerative arthritis is, so absolutely. How effective will this be for the thumb and wrist area? Great question. Um, I find uh, surprisingly that people do quite well with treatment. And part of the trick is treating all the re related structures. So as an example, if you've got um, arthritis of the thumb, uh, which we've seen a lot of people nowadays because we're all texting, uh, we're all typing at work, uh, we're all stressing our hands in different ways than we have done in the past. But the keys to treating that area are treating the joint itself, the ligaments as well, and then even the nerve as well. If you do that, people then do pretty well, actually. Specifically, glenoid versus labrum. Okay, I'm not exactly sure. I think this may be in relation to your question about treating thinning of the cartilage and certainly treating shoulder osteoarthritis is, is certainly uh, a common thing that we treat for sure. Okay, getting back to the thumb and the wrist, asking PRP or stem cells depends on the degree of damage. Um, uh, it's such a small joint. I find that platelets sometimes are good enough as a first line treatment. Um, uh, and, and on occasion, like less common, we'll end up using stem cells for that. Certain medical insurance is acceptable, right? So if there are roughly 500 companies in the country right now that have the Regenix corporate plan under their benefits package. If that's the case, then these procedures are covered. Traditional insurance is not. Every once in a while, you'll find a workers' comp plan that may cover this. It's less certain. The Regenix corporate plan is a lot more definitive in terms of what they cover, 
and very clear that they make it very um, clear who is the right candidate or not. If you have the option of doing that, I'd strongly recommend it. It's good for not only the uh, employer uh, and the company itself in terms of uh, reducing their surgical costs. It's such a great option for um, their employees, patients as well, because it really gives them access to these kind of treatments in a very affordable manner. Okay, somebody, next question. I have chronic pain in my shoulder, lower back, hips, and both knees, osteoarthritis. How long does it take the procedure? Um, it, it depends on what you're treating. It's, it's um, number one, you can only treat so many places at one time. I think if somebody has osteoarthritis in multiple joints, sometimes separating the procedure into two separate days makes a lot more sense. Uh, number one, I think that is... Um, more comfortable for the patient. I mean, where none of us want to be a pincushion. And number two, I think if you want to get the right kind, the right quantity uh, of cells, you, you want to make sure that you're um, uh, treating the right number of joints at the same time. Too many joints can be a problem. Are you accepting payment plan? Yes, we work with Care Credit. There's definitely payment plan options. Okay, thank you. Look forward to meeting you, sir. Do you inject rear neck ligaments with PRP? What loves and what specific ligaments can you reach? Great question. I personally do not treat the neck, the cervical spine. I treat the lower back for the neck and we're referring to a couple of my other colleagues. To me, it's a great example of if you're an expert in one thing, make sure you stay in your lane. I have colleagues who are experts in other areas and I, I defer to them when it comes to the neck. But I can tell you that they... Um, they can go right up to the upper cervical levels uh, and they can get pretty deep in terms of hitting the ligaments that are most critical for neck stability. Um, uh, so if you do have instability of the neck, that is certainly an option, not one that I treat, but um, I do have colleagues who are skilled and know how to do that. So um, within the Regenix network, there's definitely folks who can help you out. Yep, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, are there any particular kits in the market you use for the separation of the stem cells and or PRP? What is a collection of sample reinjection interval? <coughs> okay, so um, it's a question from a physician. This is a, um, uh, I, I guess the, the simple way to put it is I, I don't use a particular kit. What, what we use, we use the intellectual property that Regenix provides us. And in that intellectual property, we essentially prep cells in a lab-based setting. So you use centrifuges, but we're not using a particular kit. The, the issue with kits is that they generally give you just a one-size-fits-all product. There may be ways to sort of adjust that on the back end, but you're, you, you, you're put into a little bit more of a box in that regard. And so that's not the, that's not the direction I go. Um, uh, the direction that the direction that we use uh, the lab based format gives us maximum ability to do this. What is the collection of sample reinjection interval? So how long does it take? So the one downside to doing this in the lab setting is that it, it is much more manually exhaustive. It takes um, uh, more um, staff time, lab time, training of staff to make sure that they're appropriately um, skilled in terms of doing these kind of lab techniques. Uh, so for us, it'll take us a couple hours. If you're doing a um, sort of kit-based method that can take, you know, that can take 30 minutes, it can take less than that. Um, but again, you, 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 you have the convenience of that, that aspect to it, but you lose the nuance and um, ability to um, um, professionally deliver a wider range of treatments. How many sessions? It depends on the patient, right? So what, what we generically tell people for platelets, for PRP, we'll tell patients, expect treatment on day one, and let's see what happens over the next several months. And generically expect anywhere from one to three treatments based on how you respond over the next two years. I don't like to tell people expect you're gonna definitely get this number of treatments because I don't think that's accurate. I think each person is a little bit different. People heal a little bit differently. What I prefer to do is treatment on day one, let's see how you progress over the next three months and then decide what to do. Stem cells, I would give it more like 12 months to see how well they do. There may be some cases where you do it at the six month mark, but normally I give it 12 months. Okay, so insurance question, is it covered by Medicare? Nope, as I mentioned, uh, while um, 
office visits, evaluation, imaging, physical therapy, bracing, all that is covered by insurance, including Medicare. These procedures are not. The government does not quite, um, does not quite know how to handle this at this point. Uh, there's a limit of government uh, that treats um, active military duty folks um, uh, who uh, it's called TRICARE. TRICARE will cover platelet-rich plasma for some indications, not all indications. Medicare does not cover it at all, unfortunately. For lower back PRP ligament treatment, what spacing and time between treatments are optimal? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I've seen people do this every month. I think that's too much. I really think that's too much. When you think about how platelets work and the normal healing inflammation cascade works, you really should be giving it at least two to three months, I think. I, I, and, and I actually tend to give it like up to three months. I just like to let people slowly progressively get better. Uh, at the same time, they start doing their own core exercises, hip exercises, that helps as well. And so I, I think you have to give it a little bit more time than just one month. Yeah. Well, you're welcome, everyone. I, I appreciate the thanks and the gratitude. Um, any other questions before we call it a day? Wonderful. Well, if there are any other questions, okay, there is one more question. Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I'm waiting. Um, uh, as I wait on that, if there, you have any other questions or you need to contact us, again, you can do so at any of our contact um, points, whether that is um, a website, email, phone number, any of our social channels as well. Okay, great question. My brother has a hip labrum tear. Do you diagnose it and how is it treated? Fascinating question. Uh, hip labrum tears are probably overdiagnosed and that's and in large part because MRIs are so good. At, uh, at, at detecting problems. And the problem is that a lot of times you may see a little bit of fraying of the labrum on MRI, but a person's actual problem is not related to that. It may be related to instability around the hip. It may be more related to the ligaments. Or you may find that somebody has a little bit of fraying of the labrum or tear in the labrum, but they've also got hip arthritis, in which case the labrum's not the problem. It's the overall degenerative process going on. So, um, and then every once in a while, you do have somebody who actually their problem is actually just a hip labral tear. Um, uh, and in that case, um, how do you diagnose it? Partly by um, uh, how's a person's exam? Like, do they have some classic um, uh, uh, symptoms that they describe as well? Examination findings, catching, clicking, findings like that. Uh, and then an MRI uh, in particular, MR arthrogram is really your di your kind of gold standard way of diagnosing a hip labrum tear. In terms of treatment, uh, I find platelets are generally the first line treatment for hip labral tears. The exception would be if they have more arthritis, in which case bone marrow stem cells would be appropriate. Great. Well, I appreciate everyone's time today. One last question, sorry. Um, uh, yep, we do see ankle issues as well. Um, whether it's ankle arthritis or tendonitis, um, absolutely. That, that's a very common area that we treat as well. Um, okay, uh, is the webinar available for off, uh, offline viewing? Yes, it will be. Uh, we'll put it up on our um, YouTube channel and um, you should via email get a notification of the, uh, the, the link to rewatch it as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for your time today. I, I, I understand, but um, uh, just one last question. <laughs> Somebody's saying they were approved for a very specific procedure for the neck, but it's only being done in Colorado. You're right. It's maybe not the most convenient thing, but um, they're the ones who are most focused on it at this time. And so um, you wanna get it done by the guys uh, or, or gals who know what they're doing. Uh, and so I, I would definitely stick with it that way. Okay, wonderful. Thank you everyone for your time and uh, best of luck and uh, look forward to talking, communicating in the future. Have a good day and live well. Bye-bye.